a round of applause to Tiago Caxias. I was going to say good afternoon since we have already passed noon, but in Portugal, um, uh, when we didn't already have lunch, it's morning yet, so good morning, everyone. Um, this is going to be something practical, about practical stuff, and I'm going to say that um, Hugo's talk was amazing, but getting the stuff that Hugo did in production, serving live traffic, is hell, and I'm going to show it to you and how you can do it successfully. So, if you read, if you saw Hugo's talk, take every word that he said and accept that you need an extra step to put it into production and working. Um, so, my name is Tiago Caxias, and I like a bunch of stuff about software, blah, 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 but in the last days I have two kids of four and six and what I actually do is watch cartoons with them, so if you have free time, uh, turn on a boomerang at 9 a.m. and at 9 p.m. actually, and you'll watch Greasy and the Lemmings. It's an amazing cartoon, it's like um, Tom and Jerry from the old times with others squashing and splatting, it's amazing. Okay, um, I work for TalkDesk, uh, so TalkDesk is a, um, a contact center in the cloud. It was a startup in 2011. Uh, right now we have over 300 people in two countries. Um, four cities. Uh, we have amazing features like very advanced routing, a couple, uh, lots of integrations with um, whoever you want to integrate with, uh, over uh, 140 million API calls per month. But usually what people ask me about TalkDesk is, okay, but what do you run in production? So this is what we run in production. This is the, uh, the common buzzword bingo. If you want to take pictures, this is the time. So our, we have around 60 microservices. We are totally event-driven, so these 60 microservices, they don't usually call, do API calls among each other. They launch events to event buses, event buses, and that's how they do most of the communication. The core platform is an Elixir in Phoenix because of uh, concurrency. Uh, Elixir is a language that runs on the Erlang VM. Uh, our API gateway and some of the core services are uh, in Kotlin. Uh, the API gateway is using Zool, and some of the core services are in Kotlin Spring, and the original Monolith and some of the other services are running on Ruby. We have more than a handful of RabbitMQ clusters and a bunch of data stores that nobody really cares about, except for the guys who are on call, obviously. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. Um, so first I'm gonna talk to you about the hype of data, which I don't really need to talk to you about because who already did. And um, then the first failure, which is when you get, try to get your first project into production and it goes kaboom. And then what happens is that usually you do a second try and it's much more uh, limited and it happens to succeed. Then we're going to uh, open it up and see why it succeeds, why it succeeded. And then we're gonna build something great with the learnings that we did before. And then we're gonna just be really happy because it all just worked. Um, can you just test if this link works, please? Come on, you guys have smartphones, laptops, everyone was doing just anything else, but. Okay, so um, I applied to talk here. I was extremely lucky to be accepted, and I had no freaking idea on how the audience was going to be, so what I did was, I don't know if you guys are going to like this, so what I did was, I did like a soundtrack, for those of you who do not want to listen to the talk, just put on your headphones and listen to the song <laughs> while I talk. So uh, I won't be offended at all. It's working. Awesome. Okay. So what I did was uh, each of the songs would be for each of the parts of the talk. So you just play along. I'll tell you when you have to hit next. So we'll move along. So the um, starting by the beginning. Okay. There we go. So we had a gold rush when the hype of data started, right? You went uh, for everything that was data related and you wanted to eat it up. 
Uh, so you had the big data and the analytics over the massive data sets, the AI, and then machine learning, and now the deep learning with TensorFlow and Keras, and you can just um, read the emails that are popping into your um, mailbox uh, on Medium, like in AI architecture in five simple steps, and so on and so forth, and then all of those hype, and you say, wow, I can do this, I can totally do this, I just have to follow, it's like a tutorial. And you put it on your laptop, and it does work. And sometimes you do, um, uh, prototypes and they do work. And the thing is, the promises are amazing. And yes, they do work. It's proven, it works. Uh, and you want to do this. You totally want to do this. Um, and when you think about it, you say, well, I have great software engineers. Why shouldn't I be able to do it? I can totally do this. So, let's go for it. Except it, when you try to go for it, okay, press next now, okay. When you try to go for it, it feels like you're never there. You try to reach it, but you have pitfalls. And, okay, so we have two approaches to go about this. The first one is you try to build something in-house, hire a couple of experts and so on and so forth, or aim to uh, pay for another company to do it the first steps for you, and they come on over with uh, nice requirements and designs, and then you have that Okay, common period in which you have to learn um, about everything, and it's the first step that you take is to learn that data is terribly messy, and you have to learn how to do pipelines and so on and so forth. And in the first time that you have that batch of data that you find it's useful, and you find some use for it in production, you are like super happy. You are like the most, most happy, um, the happiest guy in the world. And in that moment, you're you have a little frustration, which is realizing that all of that high tech that you read about uh, is completely useless because the scale of your first batch, uh, it's not interesting at that moment, but it will be. It will be, and you know that it will be. But okay, uh, the thing is, you build a prototype, and the prototype is a success. Uh, it's amazing, it's working, and so on and so forth. It's serving proper data, it passes all tests. Uh, you convince everyone, and let's put it into production, and that's the moment where you have let toggle, and you turn on the live traffic, and it goes kaboom. And this is the funny part, because live traffic, except, okay, there are exceptions, of course, if you have a very subtle traffic, a low amount of traffic, but regular traffic is like, well, they call it live traffic because it's live, like a living being, it's because it's cold. It's the reason why it's called live traffic. Um, you don't know what to expect of it, and it will surprise you every time. So what happens is um, it fails. And why did it fail? Well, it failed for several reasons, but when it fails, nobody really cares why. What happens is the on-call team tries to understand the issue, and then the data team tries to apply patches, but the problem resurfaces on other matters, and the features end up being turned off. Why you cannot have live traffic serving wrong requests or bad requests or failed applications. And the data team um, cannot correct the problem in time and the project ends up being uh, forgotten into oblivion. And um, so before this, anyone has passed through this process of having a data project which has failed? Okay, it's one person. Uh, all of the rest, you can take off your headphones. Anyone as pressed to the data project? Okay. Okay, next song. Uh, you have to thank for Daft Punk for this one. So, a couple of months later, there's a C level comes along and says, okay, hey, remember that data thing that had a couple of promises? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was going to re revolutionize everything. That's the catch. We had one of the customers that asked for one specific feature that was in that thing that you promised, I want it done. And yeah, in that moment you know it's screwed. And you say, uh-oh, <laughs> this is not where I want it to be. And, but be smart. And you say, well, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna fall in the same pitfall, not again. And they say, okay, I'm not gonna do the same fiasco, so I'm not gonna build everything or an entire team or this infrastructure or nothing. I'm gonna aim for the cloud, specific service, self-contained, something really small. And this is what you do. You pick two of your best software engineers who know exactly what you're doing. And one data engineer, or 
person from BI who knows how to do a data pipelines. And then you pick one guy who knows how to read data, data analyst, data scientist, you really don't care, just pick one of that, those, and place, put it there, okay? And you put it into production and it just works. And you look kind of bedazzled, your C level's happy, your customers are happy, like the features going on. Uh, you're happy but stupid at the same time because you didn't know what happened. And with all of those numbers, like the less than half the people, blah, 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 it's working. Not to prototype, the production thing. And this is the funny part. So, um, you want to know what happened. And, okay, so, this happened. You want to block everything and say, okay, I want to rip you open and see what happened. So, this is what you do. Okay, next song, this is song four now. Uh, you want to find out why. You say, okay, it was the cloud, totally. It was the cloud, because the service and then you think, okay, this makes no sense, because the software engineers, um, they know their thing. So, the service that we have in the cloud is the same that they would code, ah, uh, come on. Okay, it was a simple use case. But what happens is that one month later, the C-level comes along and say, okay, I need another feature, and they add a second feature, and it keeps working. So the simple use case, use case doesn't make sense because it's a more complex use case and it keeps working. Okay, it was a smaller team. Come on, that isn't, doesn't even make sense. And you think, okay, you pull everything, everyone, and say, okay, talk to me, tell me what's happening. Uh, what did you do differently from this time uh, regarding our first try? And they say they did everything differently. They say, but how come? Well, using a cloud provider, a service, and so on and so forth. We had just a couple of people, we had to do it differently. And they say, okay, give me the, the hardcore details. So, it's an external service. We did an external call. So, it may fail. We did like circuit breaking, proper fallbacks, caching break off. Okay, that makes sense. How did you do it in the first try? Well, the service was like co-located. Uh, the data team exposed an API. We call the API. And um, you can remove your headphones. Do you know this picture? This, um, the, the thinker, right? Okay. This is a statue from uh, Auguste Rodin. Uh, the funny thing is uh, he liked uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. And this first edition of the statue was exactly at the front Okay, uh, of the gates of hell. So this is you right now, feeling the, the heat of hell, thinking what the hell is happening here, uh, and thinking about it. Uh, and this is the solution. You were just hit by a case of impedance mismatch. Do you remember this from the time of object-oriented languages and relational databases? Who remembers this term? Okay, two, three people. Okay, who knows ob object-oriented languages? Okay, who likes object-oriented languages? Okay, I forgive you. Um, so, what happened here? First of all, the data stack shouldn't be serving live traffic inbound. Why not? You force your data specialist to do two things. Data work, which is the thing that they're expert on, and software engineering, in which they also require knowledge of all of your context. And the data stack was not ready to do what you thought it was. Well, because it failed, right? So, the impedance this mismatch was met at four levels. First of all, the data engineering skills are not software engineering skills. It's not that the data engineer don't have software engineer skills, it's that they don't need to. Come on, let them do the work, right? So, they need have different skills, let them work. And then the tech stack. Um, if you look at like job offers for data engineers and software engineers, or if you work with both, you know that they have skills in different stacks. They are different, let them do their thing, let them have their proper knowledge. And drive, if you talk to data engineers and to software engineers about the project, they're all looking in different directions, and that's how it is, and that's how it should be, and that's what happened here. They were looking in different directions, and your data stack was built uh, thinking in different things. And obviously regarding SLAs. A data stack that has two nines may be live for tons of time, and most of you may have data stacks that fulfill just two nines or three nines, and you cannot have a live stack who has just two nines, right? Because 14 uh, minutes per day uh, of downtime on your website would be like a collapse. And as well as four nines would be more than acceptable for your website, right? Okay, now what? Let's freaking build it. 
let's take giant steps here and aim for the top. So this is song five. Um, so let's redo the project. Assemble a team, data people, um, pick them on and say, okay, pick your own tools, do what you want to do, lock them on, on um, some room, throw away the key, and then you talk to software engineers and say, okay, they're going to do their thing, they know what they're doing, don't bother them at all. You are going to do the connection, but a proper connection. Circuit breaking, caching, exponential back off, and dynamic routing. I'm going to explain about the dynamic routing. And wait, wait, wait. Does anybody know what microservices are? No one knows what microservices are. Okay, going to have loads of fun with Antonio's talk right now. So, um, so is this what you, uh, microservices should be? No, this is not what microservices should be. Microservices is about the services. This is how networks should be among the microservices. Okay, so um, when you have services or microservices, you should have them loosely coupled, and this, these are the contracts that you should be coupling your microservices with. Okay, so proper network timeouts for exponential back off, uh, circuit breaking for load shedding, request collapsing, request caching, and of course, advanced routing. I'm going to explain why. And like Netflix said on a blog post, and no one can say it better, uh, fault tol tolerance is a, a requirement um, every time. And so this is the thing your users, when you connect to the platform, you have to have like a decent connector. I was going to write decency connector, but I thought it was going to be too hardcore. But then that decent connector does a connection to the data stack. The thing is, this decent connector may be a library inside your live stack or in the connection itself. I'm going to post examples in the end. Okay. And this is the end. When you look at it and say, wow, it's all working. Why is it all working? Because, well, first of all, the data team is accountable just for their domain. And when you work, it's really important to sp split things by domains. Okay? So you're accountable just this. You don't have to panic everyone when you have an error on this part, when you have an error on the other part. Uh, they have their code, their logic, their ops. They own their deploys. They own their Kanban boards, and so on and so forth. And the software engineers had what they had before. They are just doing external calls like they were doing in the cloud scenario. It's like they're calling an Amazon service or a Google Cloud service or someone, some, uh, something like that. Except that they're calling something that's providing exactly the same service, but it's an in-house stack. It doesn't matter. Uh, you just circuit, circuit breaking. And um, how does it all work? The ops teams are on call just for the live environment. You have the connection that is taking care of the rest. The alarms for the data stack have proper owners and completely different SLAs for the data team. Um, you are keeping the SLAs for the live environment, different from the SLAs um, from the data environment. The thing is, since you have everything in the connection, taking care of the, the connection thingy, um, the SLAs will not fail on your live environment. And the deploys in the data stack are safer also. Um, because of the advanced routing, right? Because now you can do Canary and Blue Green, okay? And uh, of course, the stacks may change technologies, uh, technologies more with more freedom uh, for obvious reasons. Now, how to implement this in the wild? Um, you can do this via API gateways, like Zool. Zool is a, uh, a library uh, for the JVM. Um, you can, and then you have modules like Hystrix, Ribbon, and so on and so forth. And, uh, or you can have Kong. Kong is also an API gateway. Um, API gateways work like reverse proxies, like Nginx. Or you can do this via service meshes. Um, there are tons of service meshes that you have available right now. And um, I have worked with... Nope, not me. Sorry. Is it me? I don't know. Okay. Um, we have tons of service meshes right now. Uh, I've worked with console for a couple of years. They added the service mesh feature, uh, feature so I added it on the, added on the list. Um, I think it's worth for you taking a look. So if you want to need to implement this in the wild, uh, take this list, pick one, and this is what I would like you to think about. Uh, things are different because they are stronger when they're different. Um, data engineering and software engineering 
are different concepts in different domains that should be decoupled for them to allow to for them to work better uh, in their direction. Um, so you should allow good software engineering to allow every non-software engineers to focus on their work. So I use data engineering as an example. We have tons of other examples. Okay, and of course that you can put um, data specialists or any other people uh, do we software engineering. This, that doesn't mean you should. Okay, so and that's it. Twenty minutes on the dot. There you go. <laughs> So, questions? Even with the sound, some of them were still listening. Okay. The Unplug the earphones. Or no questions? Really? Questions about the playlist? <laughs> Why you picked Pixies at some point? Okay. No? Because <laughs> that's a really easy question. If no one asks a question, I'll ask a question for myself. No, really? Oh, okay. okay, here's my question. Uh, how about if we added software engineers into the data stack? How does that work? Can anyone answer? Okay, so if you did that, what happens is inside the data stack, you would have to do the software engineering part, which is the API receiving calls, would have to do the communication to the data engineering part. So you still have to do it even if you do like cross teams, if the data stack was not done exclusively by data engineering uh, people, you would have to do that communication still. And words of wisdom, when I talk about cross-communication between stacks, if you're thinking about REST and HTTP, hell yeah, don't. Read about REST, read about RPC, Thrift, and stuff like that because it's like the, the stuff of guts. Okay. Any more questions? This was a good one, by the way. So. <laughs> I think they are afraid of you. Yeah. That's my theory. Well, thank you, Vian. <laughs> okay. Um, feel free to talk to me. Um, I really dislike when people don't talk to me. It's like the, I usually, I, to, today I didn't bring my speaker shoes. I just bought regular sneakers. And um, we, have, we are hiring at TalkTest. We have tons of challenges like this. If you want to think more and work less, come join us. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>